You know when that <clears throat> phrase comes, without further ado, you know it's getting really close <laughs> to you being asked to come up to the, to, to the podium. I'd like to begin with uh, a prayer. Did we pray uh, grace after meals? Okay, I must have stepped out during that time, but in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. <clears throat> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady of Fatima, St. Louis, Breed of Montfort, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Reverend Fathers, Reverend Mother, Reverend, or Venerable Religious Brothers and Sisters, it's, it's such a great privilege to stand here before you for the keynote address and to talk about our Mother, our Mother in Heaven. And it occurred to me that there's a particular historical significance to this year's Fatima Conference. Well, a couple of reasons for me, but one that certainly applies to everybody. But 50 years ago was my first Fatima conference. <laughs> 1969. And I've been to every single one. <laughs> Maybe only a day or two in some Fatima conferences, but without even trying, it just kept happening. <laughs> 50 years. Uh, Brother Mary Joseph has one year more than I do, so he's got the longest streak, 50, since 1968. <laughs> but what's very significant about this 50 is that in 1969, in the rented VFW Hall in Coeur d'Alene, we had the first Sede Vacante Fatima Conference. You see, in 1968, the Fatima Conference was held at Our Lady of Lourdes Cathedral in Spokane. That's three years after Vatican II had ended. We were still trying to be obedient. We were still trying to follow the, you know, what the church was teaching, trying to be obedient trying to be what every Catholic should be, a submissive son and daughter of the church. And we didn't fully realize in 1968 what we realize subsequently and what we realize today, that we, we could no longer be part of that church because we were realizing it's becoming a new church. So 1969 not as uh, nice uh, surroundings or circumstances for the Fatima Conference. You can drive by, by the way, on 4th Street in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, the VFW Hall, and I wonder how we could all cram into that. I don't, of course, it doesn't look very big from the outside, but we had our Fatima Conference there because we realized that there were serious problems with this new church. This was not the Catholic Church. Uh, just a couple of months earlier, or a month earlier, my father and mother had moved us up to Coeur d'Alene from Los Angeles. And my father went back to L.A. to, uh, to save up as much money as he could, sell the house, but my parents wanted them, well, the whole family and my two sisters and me to have a Catholic mass to go to, to have a Catholic school to go to. And that's why we moved north. Thank God for ca good Catholic parents who put your soul ahead of everything else. They don't just talk about it, they really do it. And I can say with the utmost gratitude that I had parents that valued this, our souls more than anything else. Being, uh, ra being raised in the 1960s, of course, I didn't understand what was going on. I could see some of the changes happening. 
And there was one traumatic day when we no longer went to our parish church of Our Lady of the Valley in Canoga Park, California. My mother was really feeling it that day. I mean, how bad is it to think that I have to leave my parish because there's things going on. And even though I've spoken to the priest and talked to the school officials about this, these new things being introduced, uh, I, I can't stay here any longer because they're not going to change. They're going to keep doing the problem, the problematic thing. And I remember my mother telling us later on that she was really cut to the heart that day. It was our last time ever going to, actually we stopped going to Our Lady of the Valley. We went to St. Casimir's Church, interesting, there was, it's because it still had the Latin Mass for a year or two longer than the others. They weren't changing that, but everywhere else it was changing. And she had put a flower in front of uh, Our Lady of Fatima statue. I'm privileged to have that statue of Our Lady in my office at the rectory. It's about uh, less than half size, but beautiful statue of Our Lady of Fatima. And before we went the longer distance to St. Casimir's for Mass, she put a flower in front of Our Lady, and it was a, a flower that was basically a bud. It hadn't opened. And she didn't have time to fix it up better. She just, it's time to get in the car and go, so she put the, put it in the in the vase. And when we came back from that, and again, it was a very monumental day, a very momentous day, that flower had completely opened up and blossomed. A little sign, but a very real sign. Her Heavenly Mother, our Heavenly Mother, was saying, this is, this is traumatic, this is difficult, but you did the right thing. But we knew that the Latin Mass was going to disappear. I remember my parents wor working on the Venerable Monsignor there. Well, they've worked on Monsignor uh, Hurley at Our Lady of, of, the, of the, Our, Our Lady of the Valley, Monsignor Kachingis at St. Casimir, saying, "You know, these are not good things happening. Come with us, we'll, or God will provide." Well, we were never able to be persuasive that way. But again, I can't be more grateful for having parents that loved the faith, that loved the Mass, and that imparted so many wonderful Catholic values to us. I was talking about the 1969 Fatima Conference, and I've, I've been able to find some old cassette tapes. I'm sure they were, from, they were made before the Civil War. <laughs> They have recordings of the old Fatima conferences. And, you, and they're hard to hear. And you listen to them. It's the same doctrine keeps coming across. Of course. It's that wonderful consistency. The faith doesn't change. Morals don't change. This is our anchor. This is our rock on which we build our spiritual life. It shouldn't change. Yes, we've had problems in the past, things that had to be corrected, but the desire there was we want to be Catholic. We want to live and die as Catholics. We know this is the true faith. So as I said, this, that was our first state of a Conte conference because we were no longer in the good graces of the Vatican II Church, and we wouldn't want to be in their good graces anyway. We knew we had to go out on our own. How would God provide? Well, we always had the traditional Latin Mass provided for us. But we were now going into uncharted territory, and we're still in that uncharted territory because the chain of command has disappeared. We all wish we could turn to Rome, to our Holy Father in Rome, to our local pastor of the diocese, the ordinary of the diocese, the bishop of the diocese. That Catholic desire is still there, but we realize they don't have the faith. So very unprecedented. The chain of command just isn't there. 
but God will always provide. The church gives authorization to her clergy, bestows on them the jurisdiction they need on the day-to-day -day basis to fulfill their roles in sanctifying the faithful. So our Lord is still working. He's always going to be there with his church. Our Blessed Mother will always be there. But one thing that by the grace of God we were able to do is to save ourselves from that false sense of obedience that just because somebody is wearing white in the Vatican, he's necessarily the Catholic Pope. We learned that that was not the case. And how much did we lose? How much we've had to suffer because of that? How much we've been looked down on? And even to this day, by the way, how, how much worse have things gotten in Vatican II since 1969? Unbelievable. Bergoglio's doing a very great job of advertising Sedevacantism. <laughs> Every day, just keep on going this heretical, uh, apostatical course of action. And people will. Some people are starting to see the truth, see, realize that the Pope has to have the Catholic faith to be the Pope. But others are blind. They, they just just can't deal with it, don't want to deal with it. It's true, you do suffer a lot, you lose a lot. If you come to that position of Sede Vacante, you may lose a job that you have, you may lose your reputation, you may lose money, you may lose friends, you may lose family. But remember our Lord said that we have to give up everything to follow him. He even used the very powerful expressions like if a man hate not father and mother, wife and children, and, and so on and so forth, for my sake he's not worthy of me. So at least in this respect, thank God we've been found worthy to follow our Lord, to recognize that his vicar must truly represent him. Doesn't have to be a saint, but he certainly can't be a heretic. One of the things that I've noticed among those who try to keep defending the Vatican II hierarchy is that their arguments are not based on past church teaching. When you look at, for example, St. Robert Bellarmine, St. Uh, you know, all, all the approved theologians in the last, well, the last few hundred years, they don't turn to them because it, the answers they want are not there. And I feel bad for them because I truly believe that the devil wins a victory in deceiving people. He tells them, come up with a clever solution. Come up with a clever explanation to somehow exculpate the heretics from what they're doing where they still retain their authority. May I remind everyone, ourselves included, the devil is a lot smarter than we are. And he knows how to confuse and derail good people even. And what happens is those that see the problem with the hierarchy and yet keep saying they have the, they have the position of authority, what they're doing is they're propping up the heretics in their position. So the heretics don't really mind people not submitting to them, but it sure bothers them when people don't acknowledge them. You see, that's what really matters. Uh, so well explained on, for example, the, the website Novus Ordo Watch. They, they're okay with you refusing submission, but just keep calling them by their name of authority, which they don't have. So what we need to do, absolutely, is strive for humility and to realize that we cannot come up with a good enough explanation of things on our own. We need to turn to what the church has taught before. And there we will be in the safe position. We will not be 
derailed. We will not be uh, on the wrong track. We'll have to wait for God's will to be done to solve this enormous challenge that we are living in, unprecedented. Again, it's never happened so long in church history where we haven't had that chain of command. God expects us to do the best we can. In charity and in zeal and in humility, we have to work together. And of course, never compromising any Catholic principle or doctrine in doing so. But that's what we've been trying to do these past 50 years. And by the grace of God, we will continue. So as I speak about this attitude of humility that we have to have, and humbly go by what the church has taught about, you know, heretics lose their membership in the church. You know, go look at the scholastic theology, look at especially the writings of this of the saints, such as St. Robert Bellarmine, go by that. And that takes humility. Again, you may have a very high price to pay for doing so. But it's entirely worth it. But this takes me to my point of beholding our mother. When we talk about the virtue of humility, we are looking at the greatest epitome of humility after our Lord Jesus Christ, of course. He who humbled himself to death, as St. Paul says, even to the death of the cross. His mother, a human creature, but the greatest of God's creatures, shines in her unparalleled humility. Her beautiful words to St. Gabriel, the archangel, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to thy word. Tell us all we, really, all we need to know about humility and how to practice it. You know, what humbles us is our sinfulness. You know, if we ever start thinking we're something great or God's gift to the world, what do we need to do? Make a quick examination of conscience. Oh, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. (laughs) Any sin we've committed in our lives, we have rebelled against God. We have hurt God. That should keep us humble to a very, very great degree. But our Blessed Mother, how did she have her humility When there's no sinfulness whatsoever, she could never say, have mercy on me, a sinner. And yet her humility is far greater than the humility of everybody else put together. How does she do it? Well, of course, God gave her the most extraordinary graces, but she cooperated with them. And what I would say that is the essence of her Humility is that she recognized better than anybody else the creator-creature relationship. She knew who her creator is. She knew what her creator had given to her. And she perfectly lived that relationship. We can make no such claim. We can only strive. We can be inspired by her humility. Remember, again, humility is such a key virtue. There's, there's one hymn the sisters sing and I, about our Blessed Mother, and I don't hear it very often, but it's, it's, I find it particularly inspiring because it goes through Our Lady's virtues, but it's, towards the end of it, it says, but it was thy lowliness that drew, uh, words to the effect, that drew thee down, the almighty God from heaven. And that's so true. It's humility that pleases God so much and pride that displeases him so much. In this Fatima conference, we are beholding our mother and we we'll have more than enough to do in the area of humility for the rest of our lives. 
But do practice it. Do humble yourself. Accept the humiliations that God sends you. As the old saying goes, Father Clement Kubish used to say this, no humility without humiliations. So practice that and you will be inspired to do so as you behold your mother. And that will keep us off or away from so many other sins and problems. Pride is always going to be at the root and at the core of every problem. Pride is always a problem with not recognizing the creator-creature relationship. And God is so pleased. When I remember something from St. Teresa of Avila, her saying that whenever she humbled herself the most, that's when she received the greatest graces. I believe that to be true. She humbled herself the most. But humility goes hand in hand with another virtue, which is not easy for any of us, the virtue of obedience. Obedience will always be the proof and test of humility, especially when we don't understand and especially when we don't have the answers. I found a great saying earlier today, God requires our obedience before our understanding. How true. Because you see, if we understood it, you know, the situation in the world today, the situation in the church, then where would the same opportunity be for practicing obedience. So God doesn't ask us to understand. He asks us to obey. And I think it's scripture that says, or maybe it's the imitation of Christ, the obedient man shall speak of victories. Ah, wanting to know the answers. How much we crave to know why, how long, and in what manner things will resolve themselves. We crave that. And it occurs to me that when the devil, in the form of a serpent, was tempting Eve, what did he say? What, did he, what was the issue? Why hasn't God allowed you to eat the fruit from that tree? Already we see a pride rising up in Eve, Eve because she answers, God told us not to do it lest perhaps we die. Does that sound like questioning God already? What, 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 why that word lest? God didn't say maybe. He said you will. She was starting in question. And that gave the devil, that lack of Humility and obedience gave the devil the opportunity for his master stroke. God told you that because you will know as God knows. You see that craving that we to know everything, to know be exp explain everything, know how things will be. Well. That made Eve reach for the apple. She also found it fair to behold. True woman, she appreciates beauty. <laughs> and then Adam, of course, didn't had, had even less of an excuse than she did because he was the head of the human race. We will know as God knows. You see why it's so important for us to not know many things? I'm not saying to be willfully ignorant of things that we ought to know, but to answer these questions that nag at us, how long, how will this turn out? That's where humility and obedience can really shine in our lives when we don't look for those answers, if we're not supposed to know those answers. I don't think it would be incorrect to say that even Our Lady in her lifetime did not know certain things. Well, we know she's certainly not omniscient. Only God is omniscient. I try to think of 
situations that happened in the life of our mother where God did not want her to know something. And it was her, obe- her opportunity to continue to practice her wondrous humility and obedience. For example, how long will we be in Egypt? They had to flee to Egypt. And the angel appears to St. Joseph, not to her. And she obeys St. Joseph, the head of the Holy Family. And they can't go back from Egypt until the angel appears to St. Joseph and says, you may go back now. Did Our Lady know? I don't think she did. But she wanted only to stay as long as God wanted them to stay there, and she accepted it. Again, humility and obedience in practice. How will everything work out? Here again, I think it's not not unreasonable to say Our Lady didn't know all of the details. Now, of course, she knows far more than we could ever imagine. She knows everything she needs to do to fulfill her role as Queen of Heaven and Earth. But in her life here on Earth, again, who was... Well, Jesus was put to the test. She's put to the test. Even the loss of Jesus in the temple, did she know it was going to be three days long? She knew there would be sufferings, but she didn't know all the details. She accepted them. What an example for us to not worry too much about the things that we don't have answers for. Do the things we have answers for, and among them is becoming a saint. There's no question about that. There's no question about persevering in our holy Catholic faith. No question about that. Besides contemplating our mother's countless virtues, in particular these two I've spoken of, we also need or we will be inspired to suffer with our Heavenly Mother. Her whole life was one of suffering. By anticipation, the sword shall pierce thy heart. But she knew even long before that that she would have to suffer because the angel Gabriel told her that she would be the mother of the Messiah and she knew the prophecies of suffering about the Messiah. So she certainly accepted those And when we go through voluntary expiation, carry our cross, do the penance of our daily duty, we are directly fulfilling the will of God of offering our suffering, our pain, for this purpose of sanctifying us, of bringing down graces upon the world. So many souls are lost because there's nobody to pray and sacrifice for them. We were, t- we were told by Our Lady at Fatima. The important thing is that we do it with love. And that even if it's the small things, make sure we do them with love. Those little sacrifices in daily life. And again, perfection is found, number one, in the small things. Do them with love. You will be imitating your mother whom you behold in your prayer and your meditation and spiritual reading, and you will be fulfilling her message. She may even do the most miraculous things for you. I was just listening to the story of the Jesuits who were living in Hiroshima when the atom bomb was dropped, and half a million people or something like that were vaporized through this atom bomb. A few blocks away from the epicenter of where that bomb went off, there was a Jesuit house. I think there was four four or five Jesuit priests. They all lived a long, long, uh, uh, ripe old age after that. And they were asked countless times in interviews, why didn't you die with everybody else? They said, well, we were trying to live our vocation. We're trying to live the message of Our Lady of Fatima. We prayed the rosary together daily. Did our Heavenly Mother watch out for them in a special way? Absolutely. Same thing happened, by the way, in Nagasaki. When the atom bomb was dropped on there, there was a Franciscan house founded by the saintly uh, Father Maximilian Kolbe, 
or at least he had lived there at a certain time in, of, of his, uh, in his life. Uh, so they also were safe. So Our Lady will do wonderful things for her children when they're needed. She will take care of them. Have a holy home life. I talked about this just last Sunday here at, at Mount St. Michael in the Sunday sermons about the importance of having the family as a domestic church, or to put it in another way, a church in miniature. If we're supposed to become holy, our family life needs to become holy, or needs to be holy, needs to be nurtured in holiness. And that's where the prayer, our prayer life is so important. Be an apostle also of Our Lady. I mean, literally, have rosaries and scapulars to give out to people. In many cases, it will make the difference whether their souls are saved or lost for all eternity. It was St. Dominic who gave that prophecy, one day through the rosary and the scapular, the world will be saved. And when we see in so few places the traditional mass and sacraments, we have to conclude we have to necessarily infer that the grace is needed will come through the rosary and scapular. Give it to people. Be an apostle. Speaking of the rosary, I want to share this story, and I, 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 I gave it to the, uh, to the parish here, so bear with me if, if you've heard it before, but it bears repeating. I just listened to it on a wonderful CD of Marian stories. It's called Under Mary's Mantle. And this is about, this story happened about 400 years ago. And it was vouched for by St. Robert Bellarmine, who lived around that time. But it was about three women. They were sisters. They, for whatever reason, they didn't feel called to the married life or to the religious life. They're living at home, you know, supporting themselves, three grown women, and, uh, you know, trying to be good Catholics and they go to, to the church one day to go to confession, and the confessor is inspired to tell something to the oldest of the three sisters as she's making her confession and you know, getting spiritual guidance. And he says to her, I want to give you a spiritual challenge. He says, I want you and your sisters to pray the rosary every day for a year. And when she brought this message to her two younger sisters, they agreed that would be a good idea. And they did it. They literally prayed the rosary every day for a year. You know how hard that can be. Remember the times when it was late in the evening, you hadn't prayed your rosary? You forced yourself to pray the rosary. Also, I'm reminded the bishop says it doesn't count for you to get into bed and pray the rosary and ask your guardian angel to finish the part that, <laughs> that you fall asleep after, 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 when you fall asleep. He says that's not valid. Not good theology, not good devo devotional practice. So these three sisters did it. And at the end of the year, they said basically to each other, why stop? Let's keep doing it. But something very dramatic was about to happen in their lives. Because one day, shortly thereafter, Our Lady appeared to them. At first, I wasn't sure if it was just to the older one or was it all three, but according to my latest hearing, it was all three of them. And she was wearing magnificent robes emblazoned with gold lettering gems jewels and by the way the priest had uh, the confessor had told her that if they prayed the rosary well they would be ador giving heavenly adornments to our lady or the they would, the angels would weave uh, beautiful adornments out of their prayer and give it to Our Lady. And I was wondering, how does that work theologically? And, and 
not to belabor the point, but there's a difference between the essential glory somebody has in heaven and the accidental glory. You cannot add to somebody's essential glory because they are with God. Our Lady has been enjoying her essential glory and reward since well, since she was assumed into heaven, at least from that point on. But it is also very true to say that whatever honor and glory we pay to her in our devotions and our prayers, we add to it accidentally. That's a philosophical distinction, by the way. It doesn't add to the essential, but it adds to the accidental. So you have to understand this because this is how it works in this story. So, Our Lady, after showing herself arrayed so magnificently, said, My dear daughter, this, these adornments, this robe represents your fervent praying of the rosary that you've been doing every day for a year, and I thank you. I, you know, she was expressing her appreciation, and then she disappeared. Our Lady shortly afterwards appeared to the second, the middle, the middle of the three. She was wearing nice green garments. They were nice, but they were n nothing like the magnificent golden robes that the first one, or the first one saw Our Lady wearing. And she said, "My daughter, I thank you for." your rosary that you have prayed every day for a year, that this middle daughter understood that she hadn't prayed her rosary very well. She was not praying it with fervor like she could have been. She was not. She was something allowing herself to be distracted in prayer, not really honoring Our Lady as she should have been. And then Our Lady disappeared. Shortly thereafter, she appeared to the youngest. <laughs> she was not beautifully adorned. Again, this is not to say, this didn't take away anything from Our Lady's essential glory and dignity which God has given her. No, no, nobody can take that away. But in this apparition, she showed herself in plain, almost like ragged clothing. And the the youngest of the three sisters melted in her remorse because she had prayed the rosary badly. Oh, she had said it for a year every day, full of distractions, almost no fervor. She was certainly not honoring her heavenly mother. And she begged and pleaded with Our Lady for another year to pray the rosary properly with great fervor every day. And it was granted. Our Lady appeared after another year to all three together. And you know what she, how she appeared in the most splendid garments. My dear daughters, you have prayed your rosary so well. Then this, the, my, this, this adornment that you have, the angels have woven, which you have supplied through your rosary, through your rosaries, it represents not only the honor, love, and glory that you have given to me, but it also shows how much you've grown spiritually. Your souls have become so much more beautiful and shining. I am soon going to take you to heaven with me. She disappeared, and sh the story ends with shortly thereafter, Our Lady, well, the three of the sisters, they died, uh, they all took ill, almost all together, and then very shortly passed away. But we know where they are, do we not? They are at a very special place by our Heavenly Mother's side because of their well-prayed rosaries. This is what the rosary does for us. No wonder Our Lady asked for the rosary at Fatima to bring about peace. The, the rosary, the more it is prayed, the more it transforms this world. 
what a wonderful, magnificent link and devotion we have that connects us to our Heavenly Mother. It's an opportunity for us to behold our Mother. Who do we study in the Rosary? Our Lord, our Blessed Mother. And other, of course, other holy people that are in those images. We are beholding them. We are learning from them. We are studying them. You know, the rosary is this marvelous combination of mental prayer and vocal prayer. It's not pure mental prayer, but it's still a lot of elements of mental prayer in it because of what we're meditating on. And it should lead us to these heartfelt affections in our rosary. And every time we pray, we have that choice. How will we pray? Mm -hmm. Will we pray like the oldest sister, the middle sister, or the youngest sister before she changed her life for the better? It's our choice. How will we, how will we pray? Our Blessed Mother is, as St. Louis Marie de Montfort says, has such a tremendous role to play in our times. And you, if you haven't read so, if you haven't done it already, if, you must read True Devotion to Mary. St. Louis uses the most beautiful logic to show how Our Lady has to become more and more apparent and turned to in our latter times. And this is the will of God. What did Our Lady say at Fatima? My son wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. She wasn't asking on her behalf, my son wishes it. She is the mediatrix of all graces. This is Catholic doctrine. She is the co-redemptrix. This is Catholic doctrine. You partake of so many more graces when you pray the Holy Rosary. Be a rosary warrior. Share it with others. Be an apostle. You can do that. There's many people you know. Neighbors. You can invite them to pray the rosary. It does marvelous things. So let us be, let us be confident. Let us be assured. It's, it's easy to get worried when we look at what goes on. But we have to remember everything is in God's hands. The devil can't do one single thing that God does not permit him to do. If God wanted to, of course he won't, but if he wanted to, if he stopped thinking about the devil, he would instantly go into annihilation. The devil has to be supported in existence every second, just like everything else that exists has to be. So when we think about that, we have to realize that God is allowing certain things, cer certain bad things to happen. And it's easy to get worried and to start giving up, to be dismayed. A couple of sayings I just came across, I want to share them with you. The struggle is real, but so is God. <laughs> Stress makes you believe everything has to happen right now. Faith reassures you that everything will happen in God's timing. Don't be stressed. Be faith-filled. It will happen in God's good timing. Do your part and leave the rest up to God and to his Holy Mother. You know, I was just looking at Novus Ordo Watch uh, website, and again, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's so filled with re good resources. But this is a, a list that was compiled just a couple of years ago. And in light of this confidence that we want to have in our Blessed Mother and in our, in our Lord and, you know, what's going to be happening, I want to just read to you the things that we know for absolute sure. I, I love this list. I just want to share a few of them for you. The things that we just know. So think about this. In other words, there's no if, ands, or buts about them, or maybes. These are ironclad things we know. 
Number one, we know that God desires us to be saved and that he will grant sufficient grace. Number two, we know that holding fast to the Catholic faith is an absolutely essential condition for salvation. Number three, we know that it is impossible for the Catholic Church to defect. Yes, it's going through enormous problems, unprecedented situations, persecution. But it cannot defect because Jesus said so. I will be with you all days. Number four, it is impossible for the Catholic Church to cease to exist. Uh, By the way, these are not numbered. These are bulleted, so I'm going to lose count of my numbers here. So I'm going to stop numbering them. We know that whatever is not incompatible with the promises and guarantees of Christ with regard to the church is possible, even though it may seem extremely unlikely to us, or we find it terribly distressing. Okay, Our, the position we've taken is not incompatible. As a matter of fact, it's the only one that really makes sense with Catholic theology. We know that it is necessary for salvation for Catholics to be subject to a Roman pontiff, if we have one, a true Roman pontiff. We know it is impossible for the Catholic Church to change her teaching substantially. We know that the new religion differs substantially in her teachings, her laws, and her liturgy. So sometimes we just have to get back to these things. This is what I know. I know this. Refocus. Reorganize. Remember, this is our bedrock. Uh, uh, th- these, this is the bedrock on which we build our activity. We know that a teaching that was true at one point in the past cannot be false now. We know that our situation today has been foreknown by God from all eternity and is willed by him at this moment. We know that no matter how heavy our crosses, God does not abandon us but offers to sanctify us through them. We know that the way to heaven is the narrow, difficult, sorrowful road, not the comfortable, feel-good, easy path. We know that towards the end of the world, there will be a spiritual deception. So these are the things, again, we know. But we know that God is always in charge. We know that our Blessed Mother is there. She will help us through whatever may happen. Let us continue throughout our lives to behold our Mother. And I couldn't refrain from these inspired words of St. Bernard. We read this for the office of the Feast of the Most Holy Name of Mary. If squalls of temptations arise or thou fall upon the rocks of tribulation, look to the star, call upon Mary. In Latin, that would be respice stellum voca Maria. Maria. If thou art tossed by the waves of pride or ambition, detraction or envy, look to the star, call upon Mary. If anger or avarice or the desires of the flesh dash against the ship of thy soul, turn thine eyes towards Mary. If troubled by the enormity of your crimes, ashamed of your guilty conscience, terrified by dread of the judgment, thou beginnest to sink into the gulf of sadness or the abyss of despair, think of Mary. In dangers, in anguish, in doubt, think of Mary, call upon Mary. Let her ever be on thy lips, ever in thy heart, and the better to obtain the help of her prayers, imitate the example of her life. Following her, you stray not. Invoking her, you despair not. Thinking of her, you wander not. Upheld by her, thou fallest not. Shielded by her, thou fearest not. Guided by her, thou growest not weary. Favored by her, thou reachest the goal. And thus thus thou experience in thyself how good is that saying, and the virgin's name was Mary. The, our prayer to our Blessed Mother is that we never cease our prayer to her. And I want to end with this. It's, it's a, just a cute little scenario, or not to say cute, I think it's inspiring. And it goes like this. The devil saw me with my head down. And he thought that he had beat me. 
And then he heard me say, Amen. Amen.